I thought today I'd give a talk about the origins, or rather the original Buddhism. Because a lot of people argue about what's the original Buddhism. And sometimes people are arguing about that in Sydney. Which one is right, which one is wrong? Now are there sort of many different types of Buddhism? You got the right type and the friends next door got the wrong type. Or what about religion itself? What's the original religion? What's the real one? And part of uh, my path as a monk, part of your path, no matter whether you are a Buddhist or not, is always to try and come to the origins of things. Because in the origins of things you come to your heart. And in your heart, there you find life and meaning. So I'm talking about coming home, coming to the heart of things. Too often that uh, Buddhist talks can be, or any talks can be just so superficial, just words and theories, philosophies, which people tend to argue about. I know recently, so I called up my brother, I've got one brother who lives in London, he's a bank manager, sometimes completely opposite to me. He's got heaps of money, I've got none. He lends people money, I collect donations. <laughs> Maybe we can make a deal there somewhere. <laughs> we were having an argument about the impending war in Iraq. He was very much for the war, I was very much against. And during the middle of the argument, I said, hang on brother, this is supposed to be Christmas, peace and goodwill to all men. Shut up. <laughs> So we stopped arguing and remembered that the importance of all religions, the importance of all truths, is peace and harmony. There's something inside each one of us which knows you know, what is peaceful, what is harmonious, what is good. As a monk in my position, just too often people come up to you and ask, is this right or is this wrong? Should I be doing this? Should I not be doing this? What does the Buddha say about euthanasia, abortion, gambling or whatever? Recently in Singapore, somebody, I was on the radio, on stupid time, just after giving talks all day, starting off at 10 p.m. in the evening till midnight. I love doing stupid things, I've always been a rebel. <laughs> and one person asked, rang up with this question, and I've got a wife, kids, I'm having an affair with somebody else, is that okay? <laughs> you know the answer to that question? If you ask me that question, it means it's not okay. If it was okay, you wouldn't need to ring up and ask, would you? <laughs> you understand? And I told that little anecdote, and I added, if Mr. Blair thought the war in Iraq was okay, he wouldn't have gone to see the Pope. <laughs> what you're actually saying here is all morality, all goodness, isn't that in your heart? Isn't that where the origin of things actually lies? The origin of goodness? Because all human beings, my theory, my own experience, my theory based on the experience of dealing with others, everybody knows when you're doing something which is bad, hurtful, harmful, you feel it in your guts. They talk about guts, I mean you're not down there in your guts because actually these days people feel aches and pains in their guts because they've got all these sort of, these syndromes. <laughs> but what they, actually, what they actually feel is in their heart, inside of themselves, they feel that some things are wrong sometimes. And you do very well to trust those feelings rather than your head and your justifications and theories whether Buddha said this or didn't say that, whether Christianity says this or not. That's just excuses for not actually seeing in the source of things, in your heart, in the origin of things, what's good and what's bad. I remember somebody telling me, there was a documentary recently about, I mentioned this some weeks ago, about the event in the Vietnam War, over 25 years ago, where the American soldiers went into a village and massacred, shot every man, woman and child, even babies. Shot them all. That were the order. Those were the orders. Because they were told that that was, village was so many of the enemy, the Viet Cong, the communists. It became known as the My Lai Massacre. And the officer in charge was Lieutenant Kelly. It was such a horrendous thing that not, it could not be hidden. There was a big inquiry. Lieutenant Kelly got put in jail and pardoned just a few years, a year or two later. 
But in this particular documentary, the television crew wanted to trace as many of these soldiers as possible to see what is the effect of such a, an act of barbarism. Twenty-five years down the track, every one of those soldiers had huge social, emotional, psychological problems. Could not have a relationship even with themselves, let alone with somebody else. In therapy, those were alive still. In obsessive behavior, addictions, goodness knows what else. There was not a happy one among them, apparently, except one who stood out, who was an Afro-American, who, when ordered to go in there with guns blazing, refused, said no. Even though, I don't think it was a declared war, but it was tantamount to war, even though disobeying orders at that time meant military jail. And military jail was much worse than ordinary jail, civilian jail. And civilian jails in the US are much worse than Australian jails. So you can imagine just what he was facing for a couple of years. But he was willing to face that rather than kill women, children, innocent men and boys. So they asked him, why did you do that? Where did you get your courage from? Are you religious? Are you a philosopher? Why did you refuse? And apparently that he said he refused because something inside of him told him it was wrong. He wasn't religious. He wasn't educated. He got one of the basic educations and just went into the military to live as a source of income, livelihood. He was a person with no other prospects in the world. So he joined the military just for that reason. But when faced with killing somebody else, he said he felt in his heart and he knew he was wrong. Sometimes when we're taught too much, when we think too much, when we read too much, we can justify it too easily. He was a simple guy and that's why he read his guts. He looked in his heart and know I cannot do this. He suffered one or two years in military jail but then he had the next 23 years of happiness, of being at peace with himself, enjoying life. What would you do? Recently, one of our members who's here told me that he's working for Samaritans. And he got a call from a man, an English man living in Perth, who was very much responsible on the team which developed the cluster bomb. the bomb which kills many, many beings, which was used in Iraq. So recently he was suicidal, seeing the results of his work and research. Can you understand how in your guts, if you felt what's right and what's wrong, you would never do those things. You would feel deeply inside, there's something here which is going to harm and hurt others. Which is why, to help people, and all these teachings are only just to help people trust in what they already know. The Buddha taught about goodness, morality, virtue. That all the rules, whether it's five precepts, eight precepts, ten precepts, 227 precepts, thousands of precepts, millions of precepts which we make in our world. He said there's only two main things you should look after. Two main precepts for life two rules which you do well to understand and follow and those two rules the two precepts of original Buddhism of original goodness is never to do anything which hurts another being or yourself two rules never do anything which harms others or harms yourself the second doesn't that make sense? Isn't that obvious? Well, if you follow the life of those two rules, so much of what is causing pain in the world will be stopped. So much of injury and the suffering which comes from that injury to yourself and others will be avoided. And you'll find you'll all become saints. People regard you as saints because you're goodies. And your goodies because you don't create any harm or hurt in this world. 
And those are guidelines for life. But sometimes when we talk like this about badness, it's more than badness in this world, it's more than just doing bad, or rather refraining from doing bad, not hurting others, not harming yourself. Because sometimes people can do that just by never going out, never going into this world, hiding themselves up, hiding themselves off in a little hut in the forest. Sure, they're not doing anything to hurt other people, so hurt themselves, but they're not doing anything to help either. Your guts, the origin of religion, is not just refraining from harming. There's two other rules to actually put energy and effort to do what gives happiness to others and which gives happiness to oneself. Those are the four rules of life. Never do anything which hurts another. Never to do anything which hurts yourself. Put energy and effort into giving happiness to others. Putting energy in and uh, striving to give happiness to oneself. Obvious rules of life, but my goodness we forget. These are going into the heart of us. Sometimes that these guidelines actually take us into the root of things. Too often in life we just want to speculate. Sometimes in my talks in Sydney people would ask me, I don't know how many times people ask me these questions, what is Nibbana? What is the meaning of emptiness? Sometimes I ask them, so if yesterday, how, many, how much donations did you give into that donation box over there? What's that got to do with Nibbana? Everything, I said. And I'll explain why. Because Nibbana is getting to the source of things. Going against the stream to find your heart. I made a mistake. A slip of the tongue when I was teaching in Sydney. Instead of saying going against the stream of the world, which is a very uh, strong Buddhist metaphor, we actually came from when, before the Buddha became enlightened. He put his bowl in the water. He floated it on the water and said, if I'm going to become enlightened, may my bowl float against the stream. And it did. It was not just an omen. It was also a teaching. Not just that he would become enlightened, but also about the way to that enlightenment, to go against the stream of the world. And when I made a slip of the tongue, I said, to go against the scream of the world. <laughs> and I thought, hey, that's good. <laughs> because the path of religion, of insight, is going against the scream of the world. Where does that scream come from? It comes from you. Ah, I don't like this. Ah, I don't want this. Ah, why me? Ah, this is unfair. That's the scream of the world. I want. I hate. And going against the scream of the world, we actually go in and in and in into silence. Into the heart of things. When you go into the heart of things, you see how much you let go. A simile to go against the stream of the world, to find the origin. This is original Buddhism. This is what I mean by it. This is a great simile for this. When I was a student, a young man in England used to go to the cinema. In those days, people would smoke in the cinema. So these movie theatres were full of smoke. There was an advantage to that. Because when you looked at the screen of the movie, you could see a cone of light going backwards from the screen, back and back, getting thinner and more pointed until it came to a focus. Not in the direction where other people were looking, but in the opposite direction. You had to follow against the stream to its source. And there you saw in a little room in the back of the theatre a man with a machine with lights and a bit of plastic. And that's all that was there. That was the movie. Just a machine with a bloke, some lights, and plastic, celluloid. That was all that was there. That was the source, the origin of that movie. When I saw that, the movies weren't so exciting anymore. They weren't so frightening. Whenever you got scared because some monster was about to jump out of the screen, 
and sort of kill the innocent, virgin, beautiful girl. There's always an innocent, virgin, beautiful girl who got killed. Not ugly women. I don't know about monsters. They don't care for ugly women. They're really sexist. They never go for blokes either. It's always girls. We should do something about this. Sexist monsters. <laughs> so when they did this, people get very scared. And you, <laughs> you jump out of your seats, unless you went against the stream of the world and against the scream of the theatre. And he went and saw where it was all coming from. It's only a movie. It's only light going through a bit of plastic, that's all. Just see the source of things. And of course that metaphor goes with life as well. Why do you get so excited and scream? Why do you get so romantic and teary? <laughs> Why do you get so attached and this is mine? Because you're just watching the screen, you're not going to the source of things. Which is what I meant, if you go to the source of things. You just love to put money in the box, you'd love to share, you'd love to give your time for others, you'd love to care. You'd love to let go and free people. Love comes from the same word, I think, as freedom. So I was playing around with it in the retreat. And somebody said, the German word for love is Liebe. It comes from the same root as liberty, liberation, freedom. There's two types of love. The sort of love we know in the world is not freedom or not freeing love, it's actually attaching, clinging love. That's why when mothers love their children. They don't love their children. They grasp onto them and try and keep them there. Make sure they always go with clean underwear. Or whatever else it is. That's not freedom. That's clinging. That's putting kids in a prison. No wonder they rebel. It's true, isn't it? Well, in a partnership, in a relationship, where the other person, they say they love you, but they smother you. And you feel you can't do anything. You can't go anywhere without them. There's no freedom there at all. And that's why so many relationships break up. It's not real love. It's not the love which is freeing love. It's the love which is attaching, controlling love. That's the love which goes with the scream of the world. It means more screams. It's not freeing. That's why when you watch the movie screen, you're actually caught up in what's happening there. You're bound up in the action of the movie. I remember years ago seeing this movie on the aeroplane called Armageddon. Have you seen that movie? I've seen it, but I haven't heard it. I didn't have the headphones. It was one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. Try it next time you have a movie on the TV. Turn off the volume and watch, and you'll see just how stupid it is. <laughs> but is it because you don't get involved in it? You're freeing yourself and actually seeing it as if from a distance. I remember a scene in this, it cracked me up. I don't know what other people on the aeroplane thought. <laughs> well, they were in this some space shuttle or something, and it all got blown up, there's sparks and fire everywhere, and things going bang and boom, and some metal flying all over the place. And if it's only happened sort of a quarter of that much, everyone would get sort of blown to smithereens. Everyone should have died, but the hero was inside. So I knew what would happen. And once all the... <laughs> Once all the explosions and the sparks had finished and everything went silent. And you saw a brother piece of the wreckage. A little hand come up. <laughs> and the hero dragged himself up and he was okay after all. He wasn't even bruised. It wasn't even a wound. Not a wound there. He didn't even have to wash his face afterwards. It was still clean and perfect. And his hairstyle was still immaculate. <laughs> It's crazy, wasn't it? But people really sort of buy into that stuff and they think, oh, isn't it great? Heroics. Same as we buy into the stuff of the world. Your footy team wins the game. Hey! You're buying in to the stupidity of life, going with the scream of the world. Instead of going against the scream of the world, not to original. What is real life? Where does it all come from? So when we actually go to the reality of life, it's actually, it's not getting involved in things, but getting disinvolved, freeing oneself. 
And in all that freeing oneself, that's when your relationships really start to work. Sometimes people ask me, sort of, you know, Jim Brown, you're 50 now. I'm 50, 51, 52 or something, something like that. I keep forget count. Don't you miss having children? And I said, listen, I've got too many already. Look how many people I have to talk to on a Friday night and people I have to mother in the monastery. I've got too many children already. Don't you miss having a wife? Look how many friends which I have. How many people I care for. I don't miss anything. Actually, I get much more in this job <laughs> than I would in any other sort of uh, part of life. And why does that always happen? Because when you go to the source of things, you get everything you ever wanted. The most beautiful relationship of being a friend to so many people. A beautiful freedom, being able to let go and go wherever you wish and do whatever you want as much as you need. So this is what we're actually saying here, is going to the source of things is actually going in the opposite direction where you, fi you think you find happiness. You think that your children will be good if you control them so much. In the end, you put so much pressure on them, they rebel in a rotten way. It's like having a, a bird in a cage. If you have a bird in a cage and you always close the door, the first time that door is open, it will fly away and never come back. If you put a bird in a cage and leave the door open, but put delicious food and it's one of the nicest cages in the neighborhood, and you're kind to that bird and friendly to it and care for it, you don't need the door locked. The bird comes back because it loves to be there. This is actually what we mean by freeing love. So this is, do you love yourself? With freedom or with control? Are you still trying to make yourself something? To make yourself better? To make yourself perfect? To get rid of all your faults? To iron out all your idiosyncrasies? You're not freeing yourself. That's why you don't feel peace in your heart. There's still business to be done. When you actually start to understand the way of going against the stream, instead of accumulating, we give. It's amazing that, uh, first of all, I thought when you actually give charity, you give donations. I thought, I couldn't understand why you did that. When I first became a monk in northeast Thailand, we had to go on arms round in the village every morning, walking with our bowls. And these poor villagers would put rice and maybe a banana or a fish in your bowl. And the first couple of times I did this, I got very embarrassed and then guilty. Because I started to think, I, I had a good degree. I had a good education. I came from a rich country. And here was I taking food from these people. And I thought, perhaps I should disrobe, go back to England, get a nice job and send these people bags of rice. Because that's what I should be doing, instead of taking from them. I never understood what generosity meant, what letting go was, what giving and freedom was. Until one day, we had an invitation for a meal in a person's house, so we didn't go on arms around that day. We didn't walk in the village taking people's rice and bananas. I thought they'd be happy we weren't begging that day. But that afternoon, the village headman from the three or four villages around came to our monastery to ask forgiveness and to say sorry. And I was there and I thought, what, what are you doing this for? I thought you'd be glad you didn't have these monks grounding on you today. <laughs> and what they said was really shook me. Because they're asking forgiveness. They thought they'd done something wrong. That they'd upset us. That we didn't go for arms round that morning. I realized that they got so much enjoyment, fulfillment, peace. So much happiness in their hearts from seeing the monks every morning and giving their rice and their fish even though they were so poor. I understand what generosity was. It wasn't that we needed it. It was that they needed to give. And that opened up the heart, the beginning of Nibbana, 
the heart of giving, not because somebody needs it, but because I need to give. For example, by that time my father was well dead, he died when I was 16. Those of you who have a mother or father who's passed away, who's dead, you may recognize this feeling in your heart. There's much unfinished business there. A lot of that business is you want to give back to a person or people who've given you so much, who cared for you, looked after you, sacrificed for you, who worked so hard so you could live and prosper. My father did work very hard for me. And he sacrificed a lot. <laughs> I was a member of the time when I was in primary school and got a place in the school soccer team for the first time. We would play on Saturday mornings. On Saturdays my father had to work. He told his boss, I found out later, that because of some illness, he was never a healthy man, because of some illness his doctor had prescribed a series of injections on Saturday mornings. He was lying through his teeth. He was a very loving man, but he wasn't very truthful. <laughs> Even when he died, when we got his birth certificate, my mother found out that he was actually two years older than he said he was. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <Throughout his own laughs> when he first met her, so he said he was two years younger, and he kept the story ever since. It's only after he died. <laughs> he was such a loving man because he was sacrificing his job. If he got found out, he'd get sacked to see his son play soccer every Saturday morning. Imagine what that means to you, to see your dad come and watch you play, how proud you felt, and when you found out why he did that or how he did that, you know, your estimation of him grew even more. That's the sort of fellow he was. And dying when I was only 16, I still had lots to give. How can you give to someone who's dead? We have these beautiful ideas in religion. It's in Christianity you can do like a mass for someone who's dead. In Buddhism we do an act of good karma for the dead. I don't know if he ever received it, but I needed to do it. One day, sort of, I was, I was teaching in Melbourne, and somebody gave me a donation. They said, whatever you want to use it for, I jump up. I think it was something like a thousand dollars because I'd given some talks to them and they really appreciated it. I said, can I use it to buy some Buddhist party books for our library? You know, these are like scriptures. We didn't have these books. So I did. And I got them inscribed on the front cover in memory of William Betts, my father. I feel so happy to do that, to give. It's very hard as a monk to give because we don't usually have money, but someone helped me out that way. And even this day, whenever I look at those books and read the inscriptions, it gives me so much happiness I'm giving to someone who gave me so much in return. Giving is an act of love. It's an act of warmth coming from the heart. That's why every time in my life I've ever given anything, I feel so wonderful afterwards. I've just come back from Sydney. I've just given so much energy to a small Buddhist group there. Yesterday I taught, for, well actually from the time I got, basically got up and had some breakfast, talking to people, from 10 o'clock till 5, seven hours straight of giving a seminar by myself, then talking to people afterwards about Buddhist federations, and then a talk in the evening from 7 till about 10. Talking so much, doing so much, and I'll be doing this day after day, before then a teaching retreat, before then teaching in Sydney. I love it because it's a chance of giving. It's my act of dana, my act of generosity. That's why it comes from the heart and gives me so much happiness. It's my privilege to give. I thought at first that, why can't the other monks do this? Why does it always have to be me? This is not fair. We've got 20 monks at my monastery. Can't they give a hand? Do you think like that sometimes? Why me? I was taught, I realized, that it's not a question of why me, it's thank you for giving me the privilege. You know the old story of when I, again, first as a monk, when I learned these traditions of coming from the heart, 
when Ajahn Chah would come back from arms round. We'd always go arms round in the village without any shoes on. That was the tradition. So we, our feet got very dirty. So before we came into the hall, we'd always like wash our feet. When it came to the teacher, I saw all these monks get up off their seats, rush over, and wash Ajahn Chah's feet. When I first saw this, I was actually disgusted. The reason was because I thought, that man is old enough now to wash his own feet. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> That's like a Western. I mean, he's in his 40s and 50s. Doesn't know how to wash his feet now. My goodness. And worse than that, I saw there's about 30 monks were huddled around his feet. And there's only 20 toes on a foot. <laughs> so I started to think, why can't we have like a roster? You know, this monk can wash his feet, you know, one day. Or maybe have two monks, you know, one for each left, one for the left foot, one for the right foot. That's enough. Can be sensible about this and have a roster every day. You know, that's, why, that's sensible, isn't it? That's how we do things in the West. How stupid I was. And the way I broke that stupidity was one day I decided to go and give it a try. See what's going on. So I was on the lookout for Ajahn Chah. He had to be quick. He had to actually get off and run. And I managed to get his small toe. <laughs> and I was so happy. I don't, know, I don't know why. But get like a small toe of your, your teacher and sort of rub it. It must have really hurt. I don't know. Poor old Ajahn Chah, what he had to put up with. Imagine sort of 20 people sort of trying to wash your feet. And I got so much happiness. And when these things happen, you contemplate why, what's going on. I wasn't coming from my head anymore, I was coming from my heart. I was doing this out of kindness, love. This man had given me teachings, put me on the right track in monastic life. I wanted to give back. And when you started giving, the whole heart started to flow out into the world in a beautiful way. The way of the world is trying to take, get. What can I get out of this? What can I get out of this Buddhist society? What can I get out of this talk? What can I get out of meditation? What can I get out of life? And that's the way of the world. That's going with the scream of the world. You know people like that? Have you ever known anyone happy who thinks like that? Instead of what can I get out of this? The way of original Buddhism is what can I give? What can I let go of? What can I share? How much love can I give this world? Freedom. That's actually the way of the heart. So how much can I give to my teacher? Washing his toes or whatever, washing his robes. It meant so much to feel rather than think. Sometimes when we were given robes to wash, you used to get upset and angry. Why me? Why did I have given these robes and no other monk? And two people told me, it's such a privilege to do this. Once there was a monk who got given so many robes to wash. And the day after, staying up all night meditating. We used to do this once a week, meditating all night. After meditating all night as a practice, we go on our arms round, have our meal. When it was finished about 9, 9.30, we could all go and have a rest. Imagine how tired you felt. You know, not sleeping for 24 hours and having your one meal of the day in the hot Thai jungles. So this poor monk, he was from Brisbane. Just after the meal, when he was about to go back to his hut and have a rest, was given all the abbot's clothes to wash. He went ballistic. <laughs> he started fuming. You can see his eyes go red. Why me? Why now? We've been up, we've been up all night. It's time for a rest. Can't you wait till this afternoon or tomorrow? Because washing, in the old ways we used to wash in the monasteries in Thailand, was so time consuming. Hoarding your own water from a well, there's no pipe water. There's no soap powder. You had to boil water over a fire. And then you used to chip little pieces of wood from the jackfruit tree to get the sap out of them and boil out that sap. And that was sort of the detergent. And you pour that water, that brownish water, over the robe, pummel it, beat it with your hands. Sometimes it used to sting the hands, it was so hot. 
wring it, pummel it, and to dry those robes you had to put them over the lines. And because it was all natural dyes, you had to be very careful to keep turning it, otherwise the dye would streak. It was many, many hours. It's not just putting it in a washing machine and going reading a book. <laughs> this was really hard work. So I knew this, this, he was a monk from Brisbane actually. I knew this monk was really upset and fuming. And when I went to the, the washing shed, because I knew what was going to happen, he was swearing in ways only Brisbane people know. <laughs> <laughs> he was really upset and I told him something I'd learned a long time ago because when I was once having to push these barrows of earth day after day after day for stupid reasons when a Thai monk saw me getting angry he came up to me and said doing it is easy thinking about it is hard and that just clicked on so many light bulbs in my mind doing it is easy thinking about it is hard if you want to write something about your desk in work or in your home, some motto which you can always remember really works to stop problems in your life. Always think about that, write that, contemplate that. Doing it is easy, thinking about it is hard. So that's what I told this Brisbane man, a monk, when he was complaining and swearing and just really being very upset, just said those words. Doing it is easy thinking about it is hard and he shut up I turned on light bulbs in him as well as the monk had turned on those light bulbs to me when I was pushing those barrows as soon as I stopped thinking about it and complaining about it that barrow lost half its weight it wasn't so burdensome to push anymore you try it and when this Aussie fellow was told don't worry about washing those things just doing it is easy thinking about it is hard I left him to do it and he came in the afternoon to thank me, he said, you were right, doing things is so easy, thinking about it is hard. What do you really need to do in life? Just do it. This talk this evening is sponsored by Nike, just do it. <laughs> Stop thinking about it. <laughs> Which is what I learned with like, generosity. Helping, giving, serving. So I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say next. All these talks which I give on TV, on radio and stuff like that. If I thought about it, it would be so painful, so difficult, I wouldn't survive. But when I just do it, it's so easy. And when you give, just do it. Don't think about it. Don't think whether you can afford it or not. Just do it. If you're going to think, think, I can't afford not to do it. This is what life is all about, sharing, giving. Giving to your parents. It's Mother's Day soon, isn't it? How much has your mother given to you? Year after year after year. How much do you need to give back to pay off your debt? Just give. Give from love. It doesn't matter what you give. You know, when you shut up and start thinking, not thinking about these things, you start to do things in an original way. Not what other people do, not what you're expected to do, not getting the little card and the roses like everyone else. Do something different. Come from the heart. Be a rebel. Do something original. It's one of the greatest gifts I ever saw. One of the greatest acts of charity to my temple in Perth. I mentioned this during the retreat. Came when I was cleaning the, our meditation hall one afternoon. And I was sweeping behind a cupboard. It was a cupboard where we kept all of the, the robes. And as I was sweeping I heard someone sneak in. They were literally sneaking in, looking backwards and forwards like a burglar. That I sort of you know, just peeked around the corner. She didn't see me. And I recognized her straight away. There was one girl in the village who had been born mentally deformed, or deficient rather. She couldn't speak, 
she couldn't go to school, she would never get a husband, she wouldn't be able to work. But in those village life, they'd always be accepted as part of things. And her friends are the same age. They always have friends who would take her to the festivals and all the ceremonies during the year. Those friends of hers could understand the only language she spoke, which was a series of grunts. That's all it was, and it was amazing to see her with her friends. The friends understood exactly each grunt. It was like a language which has never been recorded, the language of familiarity, of growing up with somebody. You understand, you know, in your own language. And I saw this little girl, this mentally deficient girl, sneak into the hall, looking around to make sure that no one saw her. I saw her. And she went up to the, the shrine room, put her hands in, in this Anjali, in a very sort of hard way, not in a beautiful way, because she couldn't move her body properly, and put something on the shrine. As soon as she put something on the shrine, she ran out, so no one would catch her. I waited until she was gone to see what she put as a gift to her Buddha on the shrine. And it was this paper flower she had folded, you know, like a type of origami thing. But my goodness, it was ugly. Because she couldn't do very much. But inside it was so beautiful because of how hard it was for her to put that on there. She was embarrassed in case someone would saw, see her. She snuck in. She put that beautiful flower. It was ugly on the outside, but beautiful in the middle, because it came so, with such great difficulty. And so when I saw that flower on that shrine, sort of my eyes went watery. And afterwards I told the monks that that flower has to stay. If anyone moves it, I'm going to get very angry at them. And <laughs> they're going to be in big trouble with me. Because that was an act of huge generosity. It came from this little girl's heart. She wanted to give to something she loved and respected. As I wanted to give to my father. As I want to give to others, to your friends. If it's your mother or your lover or your children. Acts of giving real giving from the heart is an act of friendship and love that's why we do these things because we need to do these things to express these very beautiful feelings which come from our heart original Buddhism comes from that place from our heart which is why even with precepts not just with giving we keep these precepts these rules of goodness not from the outside, but take it from our heart. When you get in contact with this, you know, starting through generosity, starting through feeling your heart, what's really good, you know this is good. I trusted in that. I used to give all sorts of you know, gifts to people. I don't know if you know, but when I was young, I used to have a motorbike. I don't know if you can imagine me with a, motor with a motorbike. When I decided to become a monk, I realized, you know, you can't have your motorbike as a monk. Imagine these robes, they'd balloon out and you'd probably fly off if you could keep them on, that was. So I had to get rid of my motorbike. So I found a friend of my mother's who was interested in that motorbike. He came around to look at it. I showed it to him, it was a nice motorbike, quite expensive. And I said, do you want it? He said, yeah. So let's go up to settle up, because I wanted to do this in front of my mother. So we went up to my mother's flat. And then he asked again, how much? And I said, do you really want it? Do you like it? He said, yes, I want it. How much? And one of the wonderful moments of my life, I said, you can have it for nothing. You have it for free. And the best moment came when I saw the look on his face as he looked at my mother. And my mother could read the look on his face as I could. And my mother said, don't worry, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> he's not crazy, he's just got to be a monk, doesn't need any money. And my mother wrote to me afterwards, just saying how much that gift meant to that man. It was the first time in his life anyone had given him anything for free. Anything substantial. 
I'd warmed his heart. And that was worth so much to open another person's heart to giving and sharing. Remember that story some years ago in Perth? There was a, a young boy who was driving on his BMX bike or something and he saw these two kids who had captured a little rabbit, a wild rabbit, and were not really torturing it, but they were sort of you know, making it hurt, teasing it. And he went up to try and stop these you know, boys, and they wouldn't stop. So he said, I'll give you my bike if you give me that rabbit. And so the boys looked at the bike and said, you know, the bike, that's a really good bike. He said, OK, deal. And so they gave him this wild rabbit, which he took back to look after in his home, to heal, to feed, to care for. When his parents came home that evening, they got an extra rabbit in the house, and they were missing the bike. Where's your bike gone? And when he told them the story, they rang up the papers, and it was on the front page of the West Australian. He was also on the front page of the West Australian the following day, with three new BMX bikes. which people had just seen the newspaper and just sent around to him. Isn't, there was a wonderful story of kindness. A little boy could do that. He went against the scheme of the world and opened up his heart. You see, that's, that's precepts. That's goodness. It's not sort of, you know, sleeping with somebody else's partner. Because that hurts. You know that hurts. That's torturing somebody. You know how relationships work. It's not going stealing or killing. It hurts. You know that does. You can feel it. You feel it's wrong. So you don't need to ask anyone else. Ask yourself. And you find out right in your heart the origin of Buddhism. That's where it is. That's where you know what the precepts are. Because it's called compassion. And Mark's supposed to be compassionate. I sometimes say that you know, there's two types of Buddhism. In our type of Buddhism, Theravada, we're just looking after our own enlightenment. We're not compassionate. We don't worry about anybody else in the world. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? All the monks and nuns you've known? It doesn't matter what type of Buddhism it is. That's just theory and thoughts. Out in the real world, whether it's the monks in your monasteries here, the nuns in Dharmasara, or the committee members, other people who work here, yourselves, I hope you're giving a lot of yourselves with compassion for others, coming from the heart and caring for each other, helping, looking after, serving. Isn't that the meaning of life? Not what you can get out of life, but what you can give. How much you can share, how much you can give happiness to others. So this is what compassion is, just more giving. Isn't a wonderful compassionate act to forgive? A wonderful other act of giving? Giving other people the benefit of the doubt? Giving other people say, well I can't judge you. I'll accept you as you are. Doesn't matter who you are, no matter what you've done. I forgive. That's a great act of generosity. Because you're giving up your hate. And you're giving another person the freedom to change. Strange thing, that when you put another person in the box as your enemy, they'll become your enemy, and they'll always act accordingly. When you forgive and give the other person a chance, you're giving them the freedom to change, to become a better person. As you do for yourself, if you forgive the faults of your past, all those things which you've done, which you're not proud of, if you forgive those, you're also giving yourself the chance to change. Why do people always become repeat offenders in life? The reason is because, do we say, they identify with those faults, the reasons why they feel guilty. They become that person. They keep on repeating. That's the way of life. If we forgive ourselves, we give ourselves freedom. Now one person once told me that in Sydney, when he was about seven years old, he was playing on one of the many piers in Sydney with his best friend who lived next door just for a joke boys being boys he pushed his best friend into the water only his best friend drowned died imagine the guilt that young boy felt 
he had to, I don't know if he went to the funeral, but he lived next to the parents who had lost their seven-year-old. Even though they said, you didn't mean it, don't feel bad about it, it was only an accident, boys being boys. Does that help? You know, it doesn't. When, when you've done something really bad and people say, don't worry about it, sometimes that makes it worse. It's called double guilt. I mean, not only do we feel guilty because we've done a terrible thing, but we feel guilty about feeling guilty because other people tell us not to. We feel we're doubly stupid. That's called double guilt. Be wary of that. This person felt guilty for so many years about having killed somebody. It was only one day, as he put it, one day he realized that he didn't need to feel guilty. There's something inside of him saw with wisdom that he could give up that guilt, give up that pain, forgive himself. When he opened up his heart, he was free of that past. If you come from the theory and the thoughts, you can never give that up. You've got to come into your guts. And you don't need to be told by a Buddha or by a monk or by Jesus Christ or any religious teacher this. You know this. This is original stuff. And you also know that when you forgive, when you give freedom, you also give peace. In all the meditation I've been teaching recently, I told people to really give yourself that freedom in your mind. I told a story that my six years a month I was spending in the north of Thailand, in a very remote monastery in the, up in the hills, by myself. And during that time, I had no teacher, no other monk to talk to. So when my meditation started going all over the place, I couldn't watch the breath. I was thinking about this, thinking about that, the mind was wandering. It was such a struggle. So one day, I went up to the Buddha statue in this monastery, bowed and made a determination, a resolution. I told myself, for most of the day, I'm going to really put extra effort into meditating, into disciplining myself, into watching my breath. But mind, if you want to play around from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. every afternoon, you can think whatever you like. Anything goes. Sexual fantasies, go for it. <laughs> Sci-fi, thinking about all the movies you've seen in the past, go for it. Whatever you want to do from 3 to 4, you can. But the rest of the day, please, just watch your breath and do it properly. I thought that would work. You know what happened? The rest of the day I was trying to watch my breath, it got even more hard. My mind would sort of want to think about this, thought stupid ideas would come in, you get dull and dozy, then you get restless, you can never get still. I was trying so hard, and when it got to 3 p.m., I thought, right, that's it. And I've done all the work now, and I leant back against the wall of my heart, put my feet out, say, okay, whatever you want to think about mine, go for it. You know what I thought about for the next hour? Just my breath. That's all I could, all that was in my mind for one whole hour. So easy, just watching the breath go in and go out. Best meditation of the whole day. My mind was like a teenager. If you want your teenager to come to this center, ban them from coming. <laughs> Tell them, you must never come to the Buddhist center. That's my place. We don't allow kids in here. You can't come. <laughs> Why not, they'll say. I'm not telling you, just don't go. <laughs> you know that teenager in your mind? That's it there. Watch your breath, watch your breath. It never does it. Okay, do whatever you want. And it's so still. Why? Because you're giving yourself freedom. Freedom from controlling, judging. You're going against the stream of the world, which thinks that happiness comes from chasing the rainbow, from striving, from doing, from getting happiness. You're not giving your mind freedom at all. You're hating yourself. You're hating this moment. You're hating the wandering mind. You're hating all of this. No wonder you never get peace. So you say, in those words of loving kindness, wandering mind, the door of my heart's open to you. Come in. Thinking about all sorts of unwholesome things. 
Come in. When you let go, everything stops. Why? Because you're going to the heart of things. To love, to freedom. Not to control. When you come to the heart of things, it's not only giving. You give yourself the meditation, not expecting anything in return. That's real giving. Anyone who gives, expecting their name to be recorded in the newsletter, or expecting their names to be put out in a brass plaque, or even better, in neon lights. President Sol gave ten dollars today to the Buddhist Society. <laughs> That's not giving, is it? That's a deal. I'll give if you give me something back in return. Real giving is expecting nothing. Real meditation is you just give yourself to this half an hour meditation, expecting nothing back in return. Giving yourself to the breath no matter what happens. Real love, the door of my heart's open to you, mind, no matter what you do. Real freedom means real peace and you find your mind stops you come to the heart because you're not pushing your way in the opposite direction you're going against the screams of the world and then you come to this beautiful peace inside of you the heart of all religions the origin of things in giving in love in stillness, all the same words. To give is to be free. To free is to love. Door of my heart's open to you. Be free. It's giving peace to your mind. You're at peace with your mind. Or in your meditation, do you make war with your mind? Is the weapon of mass destruction you? So you're at peace with the world and you all come to the source of things. Your heart, inside, your mind, stillness, emptiness, whatever you wish to call it. When you know that, you know freedom. You know why people give donations in the box. That's part of Nibbana. You know why people keep precepts. Because the heart opening in freedom. You know why people meditate so easily, so beautifully? Because they just let go. Let go and let go and let go and let go. In the heart of things you find all the happiness you'll ever want in the world. Bliss is freedom. Bliss is love. Bliss is peace. Bliss comes from giving. It's like the simile I gave in the retreat, the last simile. Life is like being in a hot air balloon. You've got all this baggage in your basket. Which is why I said in the retreat, you're all basket cases. <laughs> and your job is to empty your basket of all the weight and the baggage and the attachments and the stuff you carry around. So you throw out things. Just keep throwing out things in your life. That's called giving, forgiving, loving, giving to others, compassion, freedom. And the more you give out, the higher you go in your balloon. Because you have less baggage, less attachments, less problems. And you always get to a stage on the path where you go so high, it's very, very blissful, but you know there's some higher to go. You look around your basket, and there's nothing else in there, nothing to throw out. Until you realize, basket, let's throw the basket out. So you throw the basket out. And you go really high then when you throw the basket out, your body. And it's just you hanging on to the ropes. And you can't go any higher. And the last stage to go really high is you have to throw you out. When you throw you out, then the balloon goes high into Nibbana realm. That's how you go to Nibbana, just by throwing things out. Similar to the balloon. All your baggage, past, future, attachments, throw them all out until you've finally got your basket and you left. Then throw the basket out, and then throw you out. And that's the end of things. That's the origin. That's the original Buddhism. In the heart, not in the words. Not in the texts. Not in the different colored robes. Not in the genders, monks and nuns. 
but right inside you. Thank you.